And so this recording is a continuation of the chapter four lecture that we started last week. And so I'm just gonna be coding along. Uh, I've chosen a lab folder. And this, if I look at the subfolders, uh, chapter 04, the, the number zero, I had one student uh, put in the letter O, uh, which uh, is an understandable thing there, understandable mistake, but is the number zero four. So that will put this code inside of that folder that already exists. I'm gonna call this class demo. And the first thing I wanted to kind of start off the top of the bat is just a little reminder of where we've already been in this lecture. And let's let this load and kind of look at the designer. And if we go ahead and make like a hello world, um, you know, drag and drop a button, go to the properties of that button, we could see the properties over here. It's always a good idea to name your buttons. And so this button will say, click me. Of course, the name will BTN click me. So this is how we access it programmatically is the name. And then of course the text is what the user sees. And then I'll drag and drop a label and go to the, the labels properties. And so the name will be label result. And then the text, I'm just gonna delete the text. Um, so what is this call that we just generated? So my first question on this Monday morning to the class, what is this little chunk of code called that we just generated? Yeah. A reference? No. Not the word I'm looking for. It is, it does have a reference. I see kind of where you, you got, you pulled that from, but that's not necessarily All right. Let's look at this. Testing. One, two. All right. Here we go. Good morning. It's Monday. First question for the class. When I double click the button, this little chunk of code was created. What do you call this? This is a method, but it's a specific type of method called Steven. It is an event handler. That is correct. An event handler is a method. This is a method, how do I know that? Because it has parentheses. Notice what I'm highlighting here are these sets of parentheses. Okay, an event handler is a method that runs when an event is triggered or an event occurs. This event handler is called button click me underscore click. It's the click event. The control is button is called to button click me. So this is an event handler that runs on click. Now, one thing that we didn't, we haven't covered yet, and this is really, this is one of the first thing I'm gonna hit you with on this Monday morning. This is the new information, right? If I'm declaring a variable, I have a couple of options. I could declare the variable in the event handler. This is option one. Option two, notice up here on line three, I've got this thing called a class form one. I could also declare the variable at class scope. In other words, I could declare the variable in between these curly braces Notice where I'm highlighting these sets of curlies on line four and line 16. If I declare my variable in between this, in between these curlies, then I want you to realize this variable is accessible everywhere in between those curlies. However, if I declare my variable in between these curlies, well, that variable is only accessible in between those curlies. When I'm saying a variable is accessible, it means what parts of the code can work with the variable, okay? That's given the name and that name is called scope. So when I say class scope, what I'm saying is it's, in, it's accessible in between the curlies 
of the class. The class begins on line four and kind of ends down here at line 16. All right, so if I were to go into here and I were to say, you know, int my number equals 32. Okay, I could declare my variable there. This is inside of my event handler. And this is given a name called local scope. This is all very good. This is going to be very relevant for you guys very soon. Okay. Notice if I go outside of my event handler, if I were to say my number right away, I'm not getting IntelliSense, so I can tell something's wrong, equals 12, I'm getting the red squigglies. I'm getting the red squigglies because it says this variable does not exist in the current context. Okay, in other words, you would say it's out of scope. So when you have local scope, your variable is only available in between, well, only available for that event handler or that method in this case. They're both, that's both true. Okay, now notice if I kind of go out here, and if I were to say int my number equals 32, okay, this is both declaring and initializing my variable. And then maybe in my event handler, I could say my number equals 12. Well, you can, you can already see that declaring this at the class scope kind of broadens the scope at which this variable can be used. It can be used inside of the event handler and outside of the event handler. So what's the right answer here? Well, there is, it depends. The right answer, which, in other words, do you declare all your variables at the class scope or do you declare them at the local scope? And the answer is it depends. If you only need your variable for that, for that button click, then it's actually best to just declare and use your variable for that button click. In other words, if you don't need to work with that data after the button click, then keep it local scope. What that does is it creates the variable in RAM for a shorter amount of time, and then when it goes out of scope, then basically it releases the RAM back to the operating system to use. So you're only reserving the, the variable for a shorter amount of time, okay? Declaring a variable for class scope, the way this works is this variable comes in scope whenever that form is loaded, and it'll stay in RAM for a longer period of time, basically until you close the form, okay? So basically, it's gonna be easier to declare class scope variables because they're just more accessible, but that doesn't always mean it's the right answer, okay? So right off the top, I just kinda wanna hit you with this. Now, I just wanna point this out. If I've got one button that says, click me, I'll make another button that says, you know, don't click me whatever it doesn't don't click me and this will be btn don't click okay and I, I generate an event handler for this button click well my number is accessible to all of these okay my number is in scope inside of all the event handlers of all the different controls on my form because i declared it at the class level Okay, now none of that really is what we talked about last week. This is all new information that deals specifically with variables inside of forms. Christian? Um, so moving it in and out of local versus global, it kind of just optimization for the RAM? Optimization for the RAM. Yeah, how long is that variable in the RAM? How long is it stored in the RAM? And the, the, the idea there, if, if you're not using the variable, don't keep it in RAM. Right? If the variable's not usable, in other words, if you don't need it anymore, get it out of there. Okay? Now, what we did learn last week, if I could take an int, we learned that this, there's an alias here, and that an int is an, an alias for this int32, what's called a reference type. Generally speaking, there's primitive types and reference types. Reference types basically mean objects. 
Reference types basically is another word for your objects. And so we learned that even though this, this what looks like a primitive integer in other languages, int, int is a primitive type, meaning all it can do is store a number 32. We learned that in C sharp, these ints are actually reference types. They're aliases for these reference types. And what that allows us to do, even if we use this int lowercase syntax, it's kind of a shorthand syntax for declaring these reference types. It allows us to, in our label, remember we had a control called label result? Label result dot text equals, if I were to just say my number, and I put a semicolon, I'm gonna get the red squigglies. Why am I getting the red squigglies here? If I don't hover it, I'm not gonna give you the answer. Just ask, without, without looking at the IntelliSense help, why am I getting red squigglies here? It's Monday morning, so you, I know you guys aren't. I heard it. Because it's not a string. Because it's not a string. Why does it need to be a string, Connor? Because you're putting, you're trying to make a number into text. You're trying to make a number into text. This text, by the way, this is a text property of the, the label control, right? This text property, if you hover it, you can see it says this is a string. That makes sense. It's a string on the left. We've got an int on the right. So we have a problem. Remember that our data types on the left have to match our data types on the right. Well, because this is a reference type, because my number is a reference type, we actually get some methods, like a two string method that it, it comes built with. And so now this will convert the integer to a string. And we've already learned several different ways to convert data types. And this is just the latest type. So all this is going to do, you click the button, it's going to put an integer 12 into a text uh, label. And there you go. There's your output. Connor, yes. So I'm following along on the, on the uh, yeah. videos. Yep. On my text, but he's coming up with an error on the label. Okay. Okay. So... So already this morning, Monday morning, we've, we've kind of learned something new, which is this concept of variable scope. And there's really kind of two types of scope right now. There are more. There's more than two types of scope, okay? But for right now, this concept of variable scope, we have class scope, which is more, a little bit more global. Like Christian said, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't use that language. I would just call it class scope. Okay, because there's actually a difference there between what you might consider global. There's actually something that's more global than this. Okay, um, and we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit later on. Um, but point is, we've got class scope, which is right now as global as we have it. Okay, and then we've got local scope. Local, the, the, the short version right now is it's pretty simple. It's wherever it's declared, that variable is accessible between that block of code. That's the block of code that you can access it, so that's what's new. And then what we've already seen from last week is that our data types are in fact reference types, and so our, our variables are in fact objects, and because they're objects, they come with methods. And one of those methods that's a very useful method to us right off the top of the bat is this two-string method. Now, you might say, well, hey, can we, we learned this convert class, right? Convert, there is a convert to string. So this is another way of doing the same thing. Turns out in code, there's many ways of doing the same thing and there's not necessarily always a right and wrong way. And so whether you want to convert to string this way, using this convert class, or just use the to string method of the int reference type, both are considered valid. They both achieve the same task. Um, where the, the PowerPoint kind of goes from here is this concept that we can do math. And we've already done this, right? We've taken, we've taken some user input. We've multiplied it by some number, divided it, and then spit it back in the output. 
Um, this is all very normal stuff. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. The one thing that's a little bit different there is modulus, right? Modulus is simply the remainder. I hit on this topic a couple of times. So um, if I were to say integer remaining equals, um, let's say the number is uh, 22 modulus uh, three. Well, okay, you got to say how many times does three go into 21? The answer is seven. Seven times three is 21. And there's one left over. So of course, modulus gives you the remainder. So if I were to, if I were to take a uh, remaining two string here, I should see that the answer is the answer is one, the, the remainder in other words. And so if I say 23 mod three, I should get the remainder of two. If I say 24 mod three, that should, well, there is no remainder at that point. So, so the remainder is zero, okay? Um, the way I see modulus used most commonly is just determining even or odd numbers. So like, is a number even? Um, you could, and we haven't learned if statements, but you could say if, you know, 2023, which is this year, mod two is zero, label result.txt, this is an even year. And we're kind of getting some interesting colors here. Else, and we haven't learned if else, but you, you can, take a guess, this is an odd year. And so, uh, let me change that, right? So you can use modulus to, to take a number like a year or a date or, or anything like that and use and, and, you know, ask the user for their year they were born. So it's dynamic, not hard coded. And you can see this is an odd year. And that's kind of the use case that I see most commonly for, for using this operator called modulus. Okay. Um, and that's, that's something that's new. Something else that you will, will see in coding that you won't see in many other places, like in your math class, is this concept of increment and decrement. Okay. Now there was actually an assignment that I postponed last week called prefix and postfix. Okay, and so you're gonna see this commonly, you're gonna see these symbols of plus plus and minus minus uh, a lot in code. And I, I wanna do a little bit deeper dive on this um, so that you guys can understand in detail how these work. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about what, what these symbols are, why they're important, where you're gonna see them in code, and then how technically in detail they work. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of, you know, delete what I've done so far. Okay, we've got a couple of button clicks. They don't really do too much. Um, Okay, so here's what the topic is at hand, uh, which is the plus plus operator and minus minus operator. Okay, so in coding, in code, a very common operation, something that happens often, is to increment or decrement um, a variable by one, okay? So you've got, you've got some number, you need it to go up by one, you need it to go down by one. Like, hey, the year is 2023, the calendar rolls over, we need to increment that to 2024, right? Very common kind of task. And another example of this is in your loops. So you've, if you're a second semester student, you've seen loops before, Loops, almost very frequently, I'll just say, they have these control variables that control the number of iterations in a loop, and it's very common to increment and decrement by one. 
So it's just something it's just something you see a lot in code. Is this concept of hey, I've got this number, I need it to go up by one, I need it to go down by one. And so a way to do that is with this plus plus. Okay? Now if I were to say label result.text equals year two string, I fire this up, you could probably take a guess at, well, that's gonna print out 2024. Okay? Turns out there's actually multiple ways to write this and there's a very subtle and yet probably academic in most cases difference. If I were to do plus plus year, well, there you go. We got 2024. You're going to say, well, there's no difference. And in most cases, you're right. If this line is a single statement by itself, This line is a single statement by itself. It really doesn't matter. This is, when you put the plus plus before, this is called prefix. Of course, if you put the plus plus after, it would be called postfix if you were to say year plus plus. And of course, if you do this, well, you might guess it's just gonna go up by two. Right, it's gonna go up to 2025. Now, let me even rewind even a little bit more, okay? If I were to say year equals year plus one, well, this does the same thing. Functionally, this takes the year up by one, okay? But because this is such a common operation to take a variable, remember the way I, well, the way I read this is I say the new value of year, what's changing is on the left. What's changing is on the left is equal to its current value plus one. Okay, so the new value is equal to the current value plus one. Because you do this so often, they make a shorthand for this. They make a shorthand to say year plus plus, right? Lines 20 and 21 are functionally the same. Well, which one's shorter? 21. So that's, you're gonna hear this, you might hear this in this class, they call it syntactic sugar, right? This is just a, a sweet piece of syntax that shortens our code. Okay, so this is syntactic sugar that allows us to do, do a, an operation a little bit shorter. Okay, so again, this is postfix, obviously different than prefix. Now, um, how then is it difference postfix versus prefix? What is the difference? I haven't shown you the difference yet. It's a subtle and I would even almost say slightly academic difference. Okay, most of the time in the real world, it's gonna make no difference. Okay, whether it's prefix and postfix. I will tell you in a loop case, I'm gonna, I wanna draw out a, a for loop. I've seen some timers. Notice where this is a postfix right here. I've actually seen it in, in the real world. We're doing a prefix. This, this loop would functionally be the exact same. I just made no difference in that loop. But this, this would actually run faster, kind of a weird little oddity of C-sharp. Doing a prefix loop would actually get you better performance. Not important here, okay? But let me show you the difference, okay? Um, the difference is, if I were to do year plus plus to string, okay? And this is just a total guess. How many people, take a guess, how many people think this is gonna print out 2024 and how many people think it's gonna take print out 2023? Take a guess, it doesn't matter if you're wrong. Let me see a raise of hands. How many people think it's gonna get a uh, print out 2023? Raise your hand. How many people think it's gonna print out 2024? Raise your hand. Okay, we have guesses. Let's see what the answer is. Turns out it prints out 2023. This is where the difference is on line 21, the way this works is it prints out year on line 21, and then after it puts it on the screen, it does the increment after line 21 essentially executes. Again, this is an academic and very subtle thing. If I do plus plus year, now it's going to increment and then print it out. So it's just order of operations. If I, nope, let's compile that. And what did I do? It actually won't let me do this syntax. Let me try convert 
to string. Let's see if I try this syntax. Did I forget my semicolon maybe? Maybe I forgot my semicolon. I think I, for, I think I just forgot my semicolon. Point is, on this one, on the prefix, let me get my semicolon back. Control Z, Control Z, before I, no, I didn't forget my semicolon. Oh, plus plus year. Uh, it doesn't like that. Um, but I can, I can force it another way, convert to string. So in this case, if I do the prefix, it increments and then prints it out. If I were to do this year plus plus, it's gonna print out, as you can see, 2023. Okay, now in both cases, I wanna be clear. In both cases, on this line, anything below line 21, the year is, has changed has updated to 2024, okay? So anything below line 21, we have the year of 2024. In both cases, the number goes up by one. It's just order of operations on that line. Does it print it out and then increment it? Or does it increment it and then print it out? I always hear more of this, you know, in the classroom, but, but, and, and most of the time you don't have to, you don't have to know this, like in the weeds, you don't have to get this deep into the weeds, but again, you know, um, it's better to get into the weeds, um, and understand and understand it if, should you need to. Okay. So that's the difference, um, between prefix and postfix and how they work. Um, again, it's, it's a shorthand. You can kind of see this is the long hand, the, the long way of coding it. This is the shorthand. We can do all sorts of arithmetic using plus minus multiplication division. Of course, this is how we problem solve, you know, um, when you take a real world problem that needs math to solve it and you're able to solve it with computers. If computers couldn't do arithmetic, they wouldn't be all that useful. Okay. Now, with that in mind, we will be able to complete the exercise of the, the prefix and postfix, and that'll be something we do together. Okay. Just to really drive that point home. Yeah. Yeah. Is it called pre and post fix in JavaScript? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's no, that's exactly it's exactly the point of like, hey, you're gonna learn it once, you're gonna learn it again. Yeah. You'll pick up on things the second time through, you miss the first time. Yeah. And that will make you better in that other language too. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. The same exact thing exists in JavaScript. All right. Um, okay, so I have my number is 32. And remember I did kind of this um, syntax where I said my number equals my number plus one. And I said, well, there's, there's this shorthand, um, but what if I want to do plus 10? There, you can't, they're like, there is no my number there's no shorthand for this that we've learned so far, but, but yet there is, okay? Because again, these are things that we do very commonly in code is to take, to take a variable and, and modify it by some arithmetic. So there's a shorthand for line 18. Now, my thing is this, line 18 makes the most sense for beginners. If I'm a beginner, this is the first time I'm coding, I'm encouraging any beginner to code line 18 before you use shorthand, okay? Because I think line 18, you gotta understand line 18 before you understand the shorthand, okay? So I would encourage beginners to code this, this way. Again, this reads the new number. What's changing is on the left. My number is equal to its current value plus 10. Okay, so, so hear me out, newbies code it like this. 
But because taking a variable and modifying it by some value, by some arithmetic is so common, here is a shorthand for this. If I say my number plus equals 10, again, syntactic sugar. It's a shorthanded way of coding line 18. Label result.txt equals my number to string, print it out. You, if you're guessing the number is 42, you're guessing correct. Okay, we can add 10 plus equals, we can subtract 10 minus equals. If you're guessing you're getting 22, your, your guess is correct. If you say divide by 10, interesting. What's the answer here? 32 divide equals 10, take a guess. Spit it out, just give me a number, I don't care what you say. Just 10, three, 14, we actually get three. What happened, what happened to the remainder? What happened to the decimal point? They got thrown away, why did it get thrown away? Not because it got converted to a string, it was before that, good guess. We talked about this last week briefly in the labs, Trey. Yeah. So notice my number is an int. Do ints have decimal points? No. So even though you're saying 32 divided by 10, if I throw that into the calculator, again, we're in the weeds here. You need to be in the weeds with me. If I do 32 divided by 10, you get 3.2. I would expect the answer if I was doing this correctly per the computer, that should be 3.2. But what do we know about integers? They don't store decimal points. So if I take an int, and div especially when you divide it by an int, an integer divided by an integer will result in an integer. I thought this was a bad thing when I was first learning to code. This is, they have a name for this. It's called integer division. Integer division, when you take an integer divided by an integer, the result is an integer. I thought this was a bad thing because you're losing data. Integer division results in data loss. We lost the point two. And so, like in my mind, this was a bad thing. I'm like, this, this is a cuss, this is a coding expl explicit word, right? This is a cuss word in coding. Integer division is like an F-bomb, right? It's a bad thing. That's what I thought. But then as I learned a little bit, it's like, well, it's not really a bad thing if you understand it. If you understand that integer division can be used to your advantage because you might not always want the decimal point, right? Remember the chicken and eggs problem that, that you solved last week if you did the extra, the extra labs? It's like, hey, you give me a number of eggs and I'm gonna tell you how many dozen there are. So like, let's just say that this is eggs, all right? How many dozens are in 32 eggs? If I take my number, divide equals 12, I could tell you this is the number of dozens. There's two dozens. I now use that to my advantage. I used integer division to my advantage. I didn't need to know the remaining eggs. I just needed to know how many dozens. Okay, so in my own personal understanding of, of coding, I thought integer division was a bad thing at first, and then I kind of grew and I said, eh, it's not really a bad thing if you know how to leverage it. We doing all right this morning? Monday morning, everyone's awake? Yeah. With me so far? Some people still waking up? It's all right. Okay. Um, we mentioned last week, it's worth repeating that it is order of operations. This is essentially PEMDAS, or uh, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally that you learned in your math class. And uh, notice the mod is on the level of the multiplication and division. So that's the one new letter 
I guess it's P E M M D A S. You guys got an extra M in there. Um, and they, and, and of course we're gonna we're gonna do this. Um, last week we hit on this concept of implicit casting. Someone remind me what an implicit cast was from from last week and and again you heard it for the first time there was a difference between implicit cast and explicit cast what does it mean to cast something let's even let's even rewind it what does it mean to cast something not not to define a variable good good i appreciate the feedback convert convert yeah so when, when you see the word cast, AKA convert, okay? You're, you're, you're converting from one type into another. So there's two kinds of conversions that can take place. One's called implicit, one's called explicit. Does anybody know? Anyone remember? Even my developers who's coded before, implicit versus explicit? Yeah, you're getting there. Connor? You're getting close. You're warming up. Well, let's let's go back to what Jacob said. He's like, hey, you had to like put like the letter F for float. That was an example of which kind of cast? Explicit, right? So, for when we said uh, float a num equals twelve point two, we had to put the F there. Remember that? This is, this is what's known as an explicit cast. We had to actually manually convert with code. We had to code that letter F to do the conversion. If we didn't put that letter F there, it, it wouldn't compile. Okay? Well, if, if explicit means to manually convert with code, the opposite would be an implicit cast which would be automatic. In other words, C Sharp will automatically convert the data types. So manually convert the data types with code. Sometimes casting can happen automatically. So this is a really good example of an explicit cast. Another example, label result.txt is a num two string. Both of these are explicit casts. We had to code this two string for this to work. We had to code this F for this to work. These are both manually writing some code to convert data types. Well, let me give you an example of an implicit cast. Um, so what I wanna do here is I wanna say, um, and there's all sorts of things that happen automatically. Sometimes uh, I want to take a um, uh, let me look at my slideshow. I know there's going to be examples. So this says casting from less precise to more precise. So this is an upcast. Um, okay, that th this is a good example. Let's look at line 18. Uh, 93 is a whole number. So a whole number, the compiler is going to look at that and see an int. So on the right-hand side, we have an int. On the left-hand side, we have a double. So what, what this is doing is saying, hey, take an int which doesn't have a decimal point and store it in a, well, 
if you think even about the number of bytes of storage, remember that uh, int have 32 bits and doubles have 64. So not only are you, are you taking a whole number and allowing for decimals, but there's actually more bits of storage on the double. So the reason this happens automatically um, is because you are converting in a way that you're going from less storage to more storage. In other words, they call this a widening conversion. Generally speaking, widening conversions happen automatically. Okay, implicitly. Yep. So if you type out that line of code, how do you know how to do a uh, well, know. well, what happens here, what happens here is the integer 93 automatically goes into a double. Okay. And, and has the capacity of storing decimal places. And I think your question is, how do you know that happened? Well, you know that happened mainly because this, this compiles and it doesn't break. Yeah. Because if that conversion didn't happen automatically, you'd get some red squigglies. Okay? Um, and so, if we kind of take a look at this slide, if you're upcasting, in other words, from a byte up into a short or a short up into an int, you're widening the conversion types, and these happen automatically. This is important. To, this is why, it, like, is important to understand what we covered last week, in that the smaller data types take up less bits of storage, and so you know we know that a byte is eight bits, a short is sixteen, an int is thirty-two, a long is 64 and a decimal we learned I think it was 128 actually if we kind of go back here where's decimal yeah 16 bytes which is one 128 bits 16 times 8 should be 128 make sure my math is crazy 16 times 8 128 okay so I can look at this slide right here. Where am, I, where am I at? I can look at this line and I can say all these conversions can happen automatically because they're widening the data type. Same thing with an int into a double. Uh, int is 32, double is 64, so on and so forth. So Broadly speaking, I don't have this memorized. What I know, widening conversions happen automatically. Narrowing conversions have to happen explicitly. Christian? Um, will it always go like byte short and what can you make go You can go right from byte up into long because it's still widening. Okay. Right? You could take a byte up into long. And so let's let's do that, right? So if I take a byte num equals six. I say long another num equals num. Well, long is a wider data type than my byte, right? So I didn't need to do any sort of conversion here. I just assigned this long variable equal into a byte. So we got a long on the left, we got a byte on the right, and it automatically did some conversion for me. Yeah? And we skipped, we skipped ranks we didn't have to go from one to the next the opposite is not true if i were to say long num equals six and i were to say byte <clears throat> another num equals num a narrowing conversion this narrowing conversion we're taking a a wider data type and trying to condense it down into a smaller data type, how do we fix it? We put, we put this uh, prefix here. And this says, hey, I know I'm losing my precision here. I know I'm losing, I run the risk of losing data, right? Losing data is always a bad thing. So when you code this 
explicit conversion, you got to know the risk. In other words, if I had some like really big number, apparently that was too big. Um, this is this is saying uh, double. Oh, I can't have a double. That's my bad. I don't. I can't have a de decimal point in the long. I got some really big number here in my long, and I'm trying to store it down in a in a byte. Well, remember, bytes can only store the numbers zero to two fifty five. Right, so I'm taking this giant number and I'm trying to store it in a data type that it doesn't fit. Just out of curiosity, what is the result of this? You're gonna, you should get some number between zero and 255. We get the number 48. That's obviously a problem because I, I've taken some value and it's no longer storing that value anymore. Okay. Um, so that's widening conversion and that's narrowing conversion and that's how to do these called explicit casts where you put the data type before the variable and this is a good point for a break let's go ahead and pause the recording okay as we resume after a break we're on slide 22 and um, there's a couple of, you know, operations on here as we're learning arithmetic and, you know, there's, there's just certain things that you might need to do, like take a number and round it um, to a certain precision, like to the tenths or hundredths place, whole number. Uh, take a number like, you know, take five to the fifth power and see what that result is. Take the square root of a number that's built into the language math.square root, math and min.max. So there's a couple of avenues I could take on this slide and we could talk in detail about all of these methods. But I think even before we dive into these methods, you know, there's, there's something to kind of observe um, about, you know, just the language in general. And these are method, uh, methods called static methods. And so before I even dive into how these work and obviously technically how to implement them, what is this concept of a static method and, and the math class? Okay, so um, I want to take a look at, at like this two string. Let's, let's, Let's talk about methods. There's methods can be categorized in, into two categories. Methods are either static methods or instance methods. So these are two categories of methods. Remember that a method is just an action, like uh, a method is going to cause a behavior to happen. In this case, you know, you're gonna, the behavior is to take a number and take it to the third power you know, five to the third power, whatever, right? It's gonna, it's gonna do something for us. And so a method itself is a behavior and it can be categorized into static or instance. An instance method, well, if I look at, if I look at this two string, um, remember byte another num, remember that there's a, data type called byte equals new byte. Remember, this is kind of the, uh, this is a, a shorthand versus a, a longer, like no one codes like this in line 21 because you just code the shorthand. But what line 21 is doing is we're creating an instance of an object. And if you remember back in chapter two, we talk about classes and objects. A class is a blueprint of an object. And then you create instances of those classes. 
And so the byte class, we're creating an instance of the byte class and we're identifying it as another num. And then we could say another num to string. And so we create an instance of a class and then we can use this method. So take a guess, is this a static method or is this an instance method? It's an instance method. I, I, yeah, if you listen to my language, I said, we're creating an instance on line 21. We're creating an instance of an object. So we created an instance of an object on line 21, and then we have access to that object's methods. And that's one way that you work with methods. You create an instance of an object, and then you have access to all that object's methods. The other way that you can work with methods in C Sharp are these things called static methods. Okay, and I'll give you an example of where we have used a static method. Um, if I were to say, um, did I have a text box result, right? Text result, no. I had a label result dot text equals convert to string num. Look at this two string method. I didn't have to create any instance of the convert class to use it. This this convert and, and remember, you know, when you see it, it kind of and I guess those are kind of two different colors. So I was gonna I was gonna point out the color convention here, but regardless, this convert is a class. You can hover it and see it says the convert class. I didn't have to create an instance of the convert class to then use this method to string. So this is an example of a static method. A static method. Static is class name dot method name parentheses. This is how you call to call a static method. You use the class name dot method name syntax. To call an instance method, you create the instance of an object, then use the identifier name dot method name. See the difference there? So when you're working with methods, I just want to broadly point this out that when you're working with methods in C sharps, it's kind of one of the two categories. Either you're creating an instance variable and then calling a method or you're calling the class name dot method name. And those are referred to as static methods. Often, so classes can be created with a bunch of static methods that offer utility in C sharp. Such classes are referred to as utility classes. So they just offer a bunch of features because you can just call on them kind of whenever you need them. So these utility classes, they just offer, you know, these are things built into the language. They offer utility. And so the math class, the math class is an example of a utility class that offers a bunch of me static methods for your coding needs. Yeah. So let's take a look at the math class. Math dot, by the way, all these little cubes, right? These are all methods. You can kind of hover this and show only the methods. And so, yeah, I can show you, you know, that there's an absolute value. There's a a cosine, you know, I haven't even taken one of these trigonometry classes where I need the sine and the cosine. I haven't taken these classes in a long time. Okay. Point is, it's kind of like having a calculator in C sharp. Like you've got these, if you understand what the cosine is of something, 
and honestly, it's been so long I don't remember. But you've you've got you've got the tangent. Math.ceiling returns the smallest int that is greater than or equal to than the specified decimal number. So math dot returns the smallest int greater than. So if I do math dot ceiling 12 point jibber jabber and I say int result equals, now it returns a double, so let's store it in a double. Okay, hold on. Let me, I, I did that kind of quick. If I hover this, notice it says math.ceiling on that first line. Do you see the word double there? Can everyone see that? It says double math.ceiling. That's how I knew that I needed to store that in a double. The return type was a double. So I needed to kind of say double. Now if I take my label result.txt and print out result to string, If you read the text of what the math.ceiling does is it takes the next largest whole number that, you know, that rounds up the whole number. So these are all referred to as static methods that are built into a utility class called math. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? If you just need to round down to the, the, the closest whole number, you got math.floor. You don't need to reinvent some logic on how to round down to the nearest whole number. A lot of stuff built in. That's thank you for pointing that out. That's that's why you can kind of say those kinds of things. You don't need the highest level of trig, you know, is if the problem if if the real world problem determines, hey. Me as a programmer, I need to understand. I need to understand tangent. Maybe I go study what is tangent. How do you implement tangent? And then I got the C sharp to implement it. Right? You got to understand the problem first, and then you got kind of the built-in methods to to solve that problem. So there's a math.min. Let's look at math.min. So math.min. And notice it says I got to put in some values. I got to put in multiple values. So I say 12, 32, or th 12 and 34. Returns the smaller of the two. Math.min. Right? You give it two values, it'll give you the, the smaller of the two. Okay. So, you know, the more you understand what's built in to C sharp, the more you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Okay, during break, Jacob calls me over and he says, hey, look at this code that I found over the weekend. I implemented it and look how easy it is to implement this feature. And the conversation was basically like, yeah, it's pretty impressive all the stuff that's built in with C sharp and you don't have to reinvent the wheel if you know what's built in. I would even take you back to the docs.microsoft.com um, and oh, what, what is the URL? Learn C sharp doc. Okay, there's a there's a full path there. .NET C Sharp. Um, and let me let me refine my search to the C Sharp API. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Read docs. is not where I want to be.
What's new in C Sharp 11? Okay. Um, what I was kind of looking for, I found, took me a couple of Google searches. On this left-hand column, these are all classes that are built in to C Sharp. And so there's a lot of built-in um, functionality that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And so as you guys are learning the basics, I'll cover what you need to know, right? I'll, I'll cover what you need to know for this class. I'll cover what you need to know for the basics. But there is a lot out there. And what you're looking at here is the library of code in C Sharp that's available for you to use. That library of code is called an API. Right, so when I look at the math class, you can kind of come in here and dive into the math class and see some of the code that's available to you through that math class. Um, here's, here are those methods of the math class that we were just looking at. And if I wanna get more detailed, like I wanna understand better about the ceiling class, here's my static method called ceiling Right, those are two keywords that accepts a decimal and returns a decimal. And so they give some examples of using it. Um, and so there's a lot more available to you besides these five static methods. And the more you learn C Sharp, the more you learn about all the different classes that are built into the library of code that is C Sharp. Okay, there's some of their examples on working with the, the static methods. Here's some more examples of working with the static methods. All right, another class that is a utility class that we'll use in this class, in, in this, there's the, the academic class that I'm talking to, and then there's the programming class. Another utility class is the random class. Let me demonstrate how to use the random. So this is the first time we're actually going to use a an object and you're, you you kind of have to create an instance first. So the task, well as you might guess, is to generate a random number. Right? That's that's the utility of the random class. Now this is not actually a utility class. This is a, a class that we need to create an instance from. So we can't say random dot. We actually have to create an instance. Okay? So notice we've got our instance here called random generator. Int random generator. Uh, int, I'm sorry. Random number equals random generator dot next so if i say label result dot text equals random number to string so this is kind of a fun little topic on the concept of randomness and computers can can a computer truly generate a random number um it's a whole conversation in itself but this is pretty seemingly random Right, and notice every time I, j I click the button, obviously it's generating another random number. And basically this is within scope of an integer, right? Because um, the next method returns an int. So it says it returns a number uh, greater than zero, less than the integer dot max value. If you kind of see the tooltip that I'm hovering over, so basically something within a positive range of your integer. 
Okay. Now, what if I wanted to generate a random number between one and three? Turns out we can do one comma. This is weird. This is the maximum value. Um, so not including, this is an exclusive upper bounds. So it will not include the number four. So if I want to generate a random number one, two, or three, this is how you would generate a random whole number between one, two, or three, right? So if I click, there's three, there's two, there's one. One, one, three. Again, can a, can a computer that you're telling it how to work truly generate a random number? On the surface, it seems like that is the case, but um, it's a whole topic for debate that we can get into another time. So it's pretty neat that we've got this class built into C Sharp that can generate a random number. Um, what if I wanted to store a double? Um, turns out that uh, you can do that. Well, an int could be cast up into a double. So this is an implicit cast that can happen automatically. So that's not a problem. Um, and so now uh, it is storing a double. It's just uh, chopping off the zero. Uh, you guys will you guys will use this random number generator in your lab. Um, you know, eventually, if not this chapter, but it'll be like, hey, generate a random number, and if option one do this, if option two do that, if option three do something else. So that's just another class that's kind of built into the language. Good question. Can this generate random words? There is no method that will actually return a string value. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Now, um, I could type random number generator dot, and you can kind of see what it what its features are. It can return a double. It can return an int. Um, next byte. It can return a byte. Next double, next single, next float. That's, you know, single representing float. But these are kind of the built-in methods that we have to work with. And there really is nothing to generate a random word. Just a, just a, just a random number. All right. Um, I'm going to stop the lecture here because we're, we're pretty... We're pretty, uh, well, two hours in. And what I'll do is I'll finish it up tomorrow, but I just wanna provide some relief and get you guys working in some hands-on lab. Okay, because we've, we've hit a pretty heavy lecture so far today. So let me stop it.